We, of course, have been covering Trevor's story for months here at Prime, and we've spoken with Trevor's parents numerous times. Tonight, we are thrilled to talk with Joey and Paula Reed under an extremely different set of circumstances. Thank you both so much for joining us. We just want to start out by expressing how happy we are, how relieved we are to hear that your son is safe tonight and on his way home. Uh, of course, your tireless work uh, to get the U.S. government's attention certainly has paid off. We just want to start by, by taking a look at the video of your son as he was about to leave Russia, some of your son's first steps outside of prison. Mr. Reed, what did you think when you first saw this video? Uh, we were a little concerned. Uh, when he gets out of the FSB van, he looked like he could barely walk. He actually walked like he'd been shank shackled or bent over. And uh, and then they had to help him get into the jet. So, uh, and plus he looks like he had two black eyes, but it, apparently it's uh, his eyes are sunken in from uh, malnutrition. Very thin as well, so obviously that, that concerned us. And, and Mrs. Reed, when did you both get word that this was happening? Uh, we got word early on in the week that something may occur this uh, week, and then we got a phone call this morning very early uh, that it was happening. It, what was your first reaction when you heard the news? <laughs> well, we were excited, obviously, and we were jumping up and down, even though it was very early, we were awake. <laughs> Roger, Roger Carstens, the special presidential envoy on hostage affairs, called us from the jet, from the airplane, and, and said, uh, we've got somebody here you may want to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so we were pretty excited. <laughs> and so you had the moment at that time to, to talk with Trevor directly. What did you say? What did that first 30 seconds sound like? Uh, yeah, he didn't sound uh, like his normal self, like um, he sounded subdued, maybe just a little bit in shock or something, but um, it still was good to hear his voice. And, and you talked a little earlier about the malnourishment, that he had the dark circles under his eyes. Kind of give us a sense of, of the food, the, the, the hunger strike we know that he went on, his, the, the environment that he was uh, living in in that jail cell for all this time. Yeah, we don't believe that his malnutrition is the result of any of his hunger strikes, uh, and those were all, uh, you know, a few weeks back. Uh, he was already malnourished. That was part of his hunger strike, and the fact that he was sick and injured, and they were placing him in solitary confinement, which is a violation of Russian law and European articles of human rights. And uh, so uh, his, his food there in the regular prison is horrible. Uh, they get apparently they get fish almost every night, and and that comes with a soup, and then they throw in a piece of potato if you're lucky, or cabbage, and the fish is so horrible that the uh, stray cats in the barracks won't touch it. And hard for you to see him like this, I imagine. Absolutely. We, I think we both were crying a little bit this morning when we saw that video of him getting out of that van. <clears throat> and, and you talk about that video during that prison prisoner swap. I mean, this has been an extraordinary set of circumstances here. The planes from Russia and the U.S. pulling up next to each other in the middle of a war in Ukraine. We know you spent uh, more than a year in Russia. Both of you met with President Biden and, and told us a few weeks ago that you thought he would do something. What do you think ultimately got this to the finish line? Well, two things. First of all, meeting with the president and uh, and giving me a little more insight about Trevor and uh, and because uh, we knew he could relate to that. Uh, you know, he's he's lost a son uh, that he loved dearly, and then telling him about how our son is. Uh, has behaved himself in a, in a military manner, even though he's not in the military anymore. He's refused to talk about his military service, which the FSB and the Russian government has questioned him over uh, continuously. Um, he's refused to work for his captors, and uh, which caused him to be in solitary confinement for most of the last eight months. As this dragged out year after year, and then on top of that, you had Russia's invasion of Ukraine, was there ever a time that you lost hope that this day would come? We've never lost all hope, uh, and we were going to continue fighting no matter what, uh, no matter what president, what administration, what war, whatever it was. I mean, we were going to, you know, keep doing whatever we had to do to bring him home, because it was our fear that they had no intentions of ever returning him. They would keep putting false charges on him, and uh, and do whatever they had to keep him there to get something for him. 
and uh, we're just thankful that they were willing to make the trade that we believe they had suggested a while back and that our government uh, uh, agreed to do that. And what is your message tonight to the families of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner and other Americans who are currently detained in Russia and overseas? Uh, well, our heart is breaking for Paul Whelan's family in particular because um, we had always hoped that a trade could be done where they could come back together, Trevor and Paul. And this was obviously before Brittany's situation. Um, and uh, we really don't want to speak about Brittany because we are understanding that her family has asked not to. So we don't want to say anything that might endanger her. Uh, but there are other families, uh, about 50 to 60 families who have loved ones in other countries who are uh, falsely detained or, or you know, hostages. And we hope that uh, this will start the ball rolling with some other countries to get deals made so that we can bring their loved ones home too because it is not anything that anybody should have to go through. It's um, unbelievably hard. Okay. And if there's a way to bring Americans home, we need to do that. Americans should not be subjected to this just because they go somewhere as a tourist or to see a family member. And uh, they're, they're targeted because they're Americans. And if that's the fact, then the American government needs to do something to bring them home. Can you tell me, Mrs. Reed, about the necklace that you're wearing? Uh, yes, this is what they call a challenge coin. And it was given to me by uh, Roger Carstens, the Spiha. And it's a, an American flag. It has Trevor's name on it. Mm -hmm. So that uh, was given to me early on when Trevor was first taken so that um, I could have it. And we know that you've been singularly focused on this for nearly three years at this point. Can you give us a sense? I mean, so few people would have any idea of what you have been going through. Just give us a sense of, of the relief or our jubilation, how it is that you feel that your son is finally coming home. Yeah, it's, it's over, uh, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, at first, you're just kind of like, oh my gosh, it's really happening. And of course we're happy, um, but I think that it's really gonna really set in when we actually get to hug Trevor for the first time, because I mean, even though we know he's coming home, it doesn't seem real until we get to touch him, put our arms around him and give him a big hug. First thing you'll say to him? Uh, we love him, we're glad he's home. <laughs> Joey and Paula Reed, we thank you again so much for talking with us and just so grateful that your son is safe tonight and heading back home. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.